The BP oil spill raises so many environmental issues from waste disposal to air quality to beach cleanup. EPA is just one of many agencies working on um, the response to, to support the U.S. Coast Guard-led effort um, to the spill. And our role specifically is collecting samples along the shoreline and beyond for chemicals related to the oil spill, um, related to oil and dispersants in the air, water, and sediments. We serve as an advisory role to the Coast Guard in cleanup efforts and reclamation of oil and waste from the shoreline. And we closely monitor the effects of the dispersants in the subsurface environment. Um, I'm here today to give an air quality and air monitoring update on our efforts and what we've found. Um, in addition to our concerns about the Gulf Coast and its ecosystem, we're extremely concerned also, and a major portion of our mission, our main point of our mission is air quality and public health and the impact, the potential impact to public health. So we've been working very closely across our agency, both at our headquarters offices, our regional offices, and with our state and local partners to make sure that we're finding out what is in the air related to the oil spill and what are the potential impacts. Um, from the very first days of the oil spill, um, we were monitoring air quality. We're very fortunate to have a very robust national network um, and in what I call the mobile sector, I think that's um, both Coast Guard and EPA language, which runs from the Mississippi state line through just east of here is um, we have 12 stationary monitoring sites. Um, a number of those sites were already in place because of the state-run air monitoring network. We added to that network in, to, in order to get better spatial coverage and in order to specifically monitor for chemicals that we thought we might see associated with either the burning of the spill, um, weathered oil coming on shore, or the evaporation of um, oil as fresh oil as it was um, closer to the spill. Um, so the constituents that we monitored for um, are ozone, which is associated if the volatile organic compounds and the oxides of nitrogen from the burning formed ozone that may have impacted shoreline levels. We were monitoring for that. We we're monitoring for the very fine particles that could be associated with the burning and are of particular concern for public health. We also added additional monitoring for hydrogen sulfide, um, volatile organic compounds, and semi-volatile organic compounds. Um, and we added that across um, the monitoring network. We wanted to focus after our initial response on the pollution that would have the greatest potential to come from the oil spill and also the greatest potential for harm. Um, we added to that fixed network some movable monitors that collect samples in response to odors or um, where we saw more oil come ashore. We also have um, what we call the Taga bus. It's a very mobile um, air monitoring uh, station that can drive to different locations in a short period of time and take some real-time sampling. The ozone and the fine particle information is uploaded every day onto the website, and you can see that on EPA's website. Um, the semi-volatile and the volatile organic compound results take a little bit longer because it's, there are samples that we take and we have to send off to the laboratory. 
um, to be analyzed and those are posted about four or five days after the sample's taken. Um, so those are some of the efforts that we've gone through to enhance our existing monitoring network. Um, I want to thank Florida and its district office because they have been a tremendous support in standing up the additional monitoring in a very quick period of time. Um, there's one other asset that we use, and that's um, aerial monitoring. It's the aspect airplane that takes that has been taking samples um, further away from shore in general. Um, so we take this information, and it's a tremendous amount of information, is put made publicly accessible on the internet as quickly as we can get it. Um, quality assured and up. And then we're taking the data and um, analyzing it and evaluating it against historical data. So what is all this monitoring found? Um, what this monitoring has found is it's not showing levels of the chemicals um, that, would, that we would expect to have long-term health effects. Um, we worked very closely with CDC to establish health benchmarks for um, exposure to chemicals that we would have expected to come from the spill. And we have not to date found any that would have come close to those benchmarks. So that is very good news. Um, we do know that people have been smelling odors, and that is real. Um, we've had our own folks smell odors. Your nose is an extremely sophisticated air monitoring device and will detect odors at levels much lower than our monitoring equipment. Um, so there, you will have some odors associated with um, petroleum products that come closer to shore. Some of the odors um, we've been trying to do some analysis to see if they're more local sources or if they're associated with the spill. So our um, TAGA bus has been helping with that as well as some of the grab samples that we go out and take. Um, while I very carefully say that we don't expect these to cause any long-term health effects because they're not close to the benchmarks, that's not to say that individuals may not experience some short-term um, effects from the odors or from the compounds that are in that are associated with the odors, like um, a burning a little bit of a burning sensation in throat, headaches, nausea, um, things like that. What CDC has advised us, and what we've found so far in the uh, surveillance that CDC has done is that those short-term effects are going away when folks um, leave the area that has the odor. Um, that, you know, we, um, we expect that people experience those. We have looked at the complaints that we're receiving, and since the capping have um, seen those complaints drop off um, quite a bit. We do want that information because that helps us better um, analyze our data and what's associated with it and helps us work um, better in looking at those effects. So we have um, a toll-free number for folks to be able to call, and that is 1-866-448-5817. And it's very helpful when folks are reporting odors to be able to describe them because it helps us then better know what data to look, look at. For example, describe is it a rotten egg type odor? Is it um, a gas station like smell? Uh, what, what direction was the wind coming from? Because then that can help us better look at the information that we have before us to um, since we have a tremendous amount of air monitoring data to tell what can be associated with those odors, what compounds might be associated. 
Um, in evaluating the ozone and particulate matter data, we have long historical data for those compounds, and we're seeing those track the historic trend. So we're not seeing anything unusual um, that we would say was associated with the spill. Um, to date, we've found levels of ozone and particulates that have been ranged from good to unhealthy for sensitive groups. Um, it's a part of our air quality index, which is on our website. Um, and those are typical for, the, um, for this time of year. Um, they're still within our national ambient air quality standards. So we don't expect long-term health effects for those, but we do advise um, for unhealthy for sensitive groups, we do have um, advice on our website that tells, you know, like you wouldn't want to go for a jog if you were part of that sensitive population that might have asthma or some other health um, condition associated with it. Um, we're continuously updating our website and trying to make improvements. So if you have recommendations, we would really want that. Um, we're looking at how to re-gear our monitoring network now that we're at this point in the spill. We're not going away, but now that we know more about, we have a broad range of data, we're looking at what we might hone in on. Um, so as we change and adjust, we're not going away, but we are going to be doing things, at least in the air arena, a little bit differently, hopefully um, with your help being able to communicate the data better, more clearly, since right now it is, um, it, the, the quantity of data sometimes is a little daunting for ourselves even. Um, I wanted to touch just a little bit on the waste um, handling portion, our role in the waste handling. Um, EPA serves as an independent <coughs> oversight role of the waste collection the staging and the disposal. We do independent um, reviews of the sites. We do, we take independent samples of the waste and at the landfills and have an independent oversight role for that waste. Yes, Ms. Kilmer, do you know exactly where they're disposing of this? I've heard different sites, uh, different landfills. Do you know where the materials that are coming off the of Pensacola Beach are ending yes. up? Yeah, let me address that question. My name is Javier Garcia. I'm, I'm uh, actually one of the inspect the site visitors that EPA has uh, brought here. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, and thank you. And for uh, the uh, Florida waste, the waste is being uh, sent to Spring Hill Regional. Spring Hill. Yes, sir. Is that in Mobile? I'm not sure. Jackson, no, County. that uh, Jackson County. Jackson, Jackson County. County. Okay. And has been inspected uh, twice by EPA already, or visited by EPA. While we're visiting that subject, a question came up as far as the uh, the liners that are currently in these landfills, and uh, are they for the amount of waste oil in them? And it's been explained to me that by the time the waste goes down through the layers of debris that are in there and the layers of cover, that the liners will have very uh, little contact with the product. But the question being is, the, are the liners uh, designed or specified for uh, petroleum products? Well, I can give you specifics on, on this landfill, but I can tell you the regulations of, on subtitle D, that is regulations that uh, pro, uh, to regulate landfill, new landfills, are in a sense as stringent as, as, a, as a, uh, for hazard waste. And if you take in consideration that when, when you're dealing with solid waste, you're going to have a, a commingle of, of people that think about what goes to a solid waste from com a normal common citizens in their house. So those liners, keep that in mind. So this is not a liner that because it's not a hassle waste facility, it's not going to be as protective as it can be because on the normal operation, a solid waste lamp is going to receive I would argue that maybe more, uh, it could be more uh, oily waste or more com that when they commingle the solid waste, it may be like people when they renovate uh, a roof, someone doing it in their house, they may send the, 
uh, shingles there. If they have a little bit left of paint, they may add some, uh, hopefully they will be adding something so the paint is dry, but it, it will still be go there. So, so landfills nowadays are designed in a different manner than they were designed before. Excuse me, uh, Aaron Schilke, Waste Management. Uh, I just wanted to weigh in on that as well. The liner systems are designed to handle this type of material. Um, and I also want to point out, we do not accept liquid wastes at these landfills. Um, the material that does go there, it is commingled with regular municipal solid waste and other special waste that we are allowed to accept. And uh, the double liner system has been proven since Subtitle D has come out. And uh, any liquids that do form from storm water coming in contact with the waste, infiltrating through the landfill. They are collected in a leachate collection system and properly treated and disposed of at a water treatment facility. Uh, this is this is Chris Olson with BP, and I'm not a waste expert, but I, I will uh, add in a little piece because I was in Mobile yesterday. There's a, there's a tremendous effort ongoing right now to look at recycling as much material to keep it out of landfills as possible, and we're obviously working with waste management as part of that, along with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and also uh, Alabama uh, DEM. One of the things that I should differentiate here is that these these uh, materials have been collected from the beaches. A lot of the tar balls and some of the, the hydrocarbon stained sands have been actually stockpiled in the in the line portion of the landfill, not actually put into the landfill and covered. And the reason we did that at BP was so that we could then have time to look at alternative recycling and regeneration opportunities. So that, I did want to differentiate that this stuff is not actually going into the landfill at this point, but it is being staged to look at alternative green options for some of that material, like recycling plastics out of that if we separate it, to be able to make some sort of asphalt uh, material out of some of the hydrocarbons if we can mix that into some paving material. So we are looking at green options, and I just want to mention that. You know, one, one thing that I've noticed, uh, Mr. Olson, um, and I think uh, all of us have, is we've, we've uh, witnessed some of the video that's, uh, that's coming from the beach, is uh, these huge uh, plastic bags with uh, just a little bit of, of uh, material in the bottom of it. And I just think of these landfills that are having to accept these massive bags, you know, thousands of them with just a little bit of material in the bottom. So is, there, is that what you're telling me? There's an effort to recycle some of that, those what? bags and stuff? or? So we learn as we go along, but one of the things, one of the changes that's come, and you'll see this on the beach now, is we've, we've ended up having to bag stuff on the beach, which ends up having a lot of sand in it, and then we have to unbag it or it's, uh, the plastic stockpiles at the landfill. One of the things we've gone away from just in the last week is the use of plastic bags for collecting on the beach. I think, I think you're going to, I can't say that it's 100% there yet, but the plan is to use much more mesh type sifting materials for collecting tar balls to shake as much of the sand off of that and to collect pure tar ball materials in pails and then to put them into line roll offs and get away from plastic bags altogether. But to the extent we had plastic materials that either came up with the beach material or that was in these plastic bags, we're going to look at recycling op opportunities for that plastic. Thank you. Continue. Unless you're friendly. No, I, I'm just uh, Javier. I was going to introduce Javier, so now we know. Right. I, I do have uh, another question. For the last couple of years now, this area of Escambia County, Santa Rosa County, has been uh, on our air quality index. We've been kind of borderline on that. And uh, I was wondering if your agency now is going to, you know, we, we've had some conditions and put it placed on us and exemptions put on our air quality and stuff but with what's going on in the gulf right now and and, and with our local air quality well some of that how, how will we recalibrate that how will we relook at those uh, issues will we use what we had before as, as kind of a baseline and then start from there or how do we how do we get back to where we were i guess yeah well we're <laughs> What we're doing is we're working with Florida to compare that historical data to the data that we're collecting right now to see if, since we have so much information, so much additional information, if there has been an impact on your ozone or PM levels. So that analysis is happening jointly with the state of Florida. If I can maybe just jump in anecdotally on that, we get daily air reports on the ozone levels, and as I've been looking at them, they're actually very low. 
right. compared to the past. We've been getting a lot of 30s and 40s for summertime, which is outstanding. But I, what I attribute that to is our rainfall. We've had very high number of rainfall events in the summer. And, and if you have rain, you don't have ozone. It, it flushes the contaminants out of the atmosphere. Um, the sun is a needed component in ozone formation, so you don't have the, the, the heat beneath the stove cooking it. So we've actually had a very, in my opinion, pretty good summer ozone-wise. So I don't, again, haven't looked at the statistics and what it's done to our average, but just kind of anecdotally, we've been getting 30s and 40s, which is phenomenal. Right, and we have looked at the trend, um, and Daryl is correct. We don't see an elevation due to the spill for ozone. Great, thank you. Yep. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, if I could, could I have everybody introduce themselves? I, I didn't bring my glasses here, and I think it would be appropriate if we, if we all introduce ourselves. Maybe start with Daryl uh, telling uh, who you are and who you're with, and uh, we can just work our way around the table. I think it would be appropriate. Thank you. I, I apologize. Daryl no, Boudreaux. My, my bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Darryl Boudreaux, I'm Assistant Director for the Northwest District DEP. I'm uh, Javier Garcia, Record Enforcement and Compliance. I'm uh, assigned to Mobile for Solid Waste uh, Oversight. I'm Carol Kemker, Air Division Director for the eight southeastern states with EPA. I'm uh, Brian Watkins with the City of Milton. I'm your Chairman Bob Cole, Santa Rosa County Commission. I'm sorry for being late. It's okay. I'm Larry B. Johnson. I'm a Pensacola City Councilman and member of BARC. Thank you. I'm J.B. Sluter, uh, Guthrie City Council and a member of the BARC. I'm George Henderson. I'm a scientist with the uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. I'm Louis Robertson. I'm regional director for the Northwest Region for Florida Fish and Wildlife, uh, basically 16 counties in the Panhandle. Aaron Schilke, Waste Management. Uh, Chris Olson representing uh, BP. I'm with the Santa Rosa County uh, Community Outreach Center over in Gulf Breeze. I'm Dorothy Kaufman with the Wildlife Sanctuary in Northwest Florida. And uh, I'm going to refer to my staff, Mary. Uh, We've got Ms. <clears throat> Mary Gutierrez back here. She's our staff for BARC. And in the audience, we have Commissioner Wilson Robinson. And Wilson, I'd like to invite you to come up here and sit in place of Escambia if you're all right. But you're certainly welcome to sit up here. All right. All right. All right we'll go ahead and continue. Uh, we have any other reports from everybody? Everybody? I think we comments? Questions? Okay, I'm going to open it to the floor to questions. If Folks in the audience have questions for these folks that are coming today? Actually, I do have a, a short presentation uh, right. on what the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission I think this is just on this. Let's, let's break it down. These folks that just spoke, uh, if you've heard from them, if you've got questions in the audience for uh, either uh, Daryl or uh, Xavier or Carol, come up to the microphone. If not, we're going to go ahead and move forward with the agenda. Right, Ma'am, if you'll come up to the microphone and please state your name and address for the record. Okay, my name is Samantha Boudreaux and I live here in Pensacola, Florida. Um, my question is to, the, um, to anybody that can answer it really. Um, you mentioned that there were liners that the, um, that the oil, the debris was being contained in at the landfills, is that correct? Yes, what are, what are those liners made from? I'll address that. Uh, the lining system at a modern landfill is made of HDPE, high density polyethylene. It's a very thick plastic. Um, it's quite impermeable. There's not many chemicals that can break it down. It's designed to last for a very, very long time. Is, is Coexit one of those? Do you know? Have you studied Corexit? that? Coexit? Yes. Uh, no, I, don't I mean, since Coexit is made to break down the oil, then therefore we know the oil is used to make a lot of things then therefore wouldn't the core exit break those things down also? To be honest with you, I don't know, but I have seen that landfills do regularly accept oil contaminated material, not just oil, but any petroleum based material. And a lot of those dispersants used at other cleanup sites, um, smaller scale, things like that. Uh, we've never had issues with the liners breaking down in that fashion. Right, but that is the question in, in, uh, in, a, smaller, in a smaller incident. Right. Yes. But again, though, okay. over the life of a landfill, uh, again, I don't know exact numbers, but it, it's not uncommon to receive um, 
you know, anywhere from 100 tons a day of contaminated soil and other materials like that. Okay, my second question is to the, um, to the BP representative. Um, you mentioned the separation funding, like being able to recycle these tarballs for other use, like break them down, use them in plastics and things like that. Can you tell me who will be funding that? Well, um, we're going to certainly look at, at BP looking at, uh, we're doing that right now. We're doing all the analysis on what might be possibly recycled. For instance, some of the plastic materials that get separated from some of the materials that have been collected on the beach uh, can be used in the automotive industry for plastics. There's a demand for that. Uh, some of the hydrocarbons can be blended into, as I mentioned, uh, paving materials. A lot of this depends on, you know, passing the solid waste regulatory rules around that and what could be done from an engineering standpoint. So we're in the very early days of this. We need to do that testing. But our goal, and I want to be really clear on this, is that we want to try to recycle as much as possible to keep materials out of landfills. And to the extent we can do that in a safe manner, we will try to do that. Yes, I understand that. My question was, um, who will be funding this? Well, right now, BP is funding that. BP is doing So you're doing it already then? You We're doing all the funding of the analysis for what might possibly be recycled right now. OK, for what possibly might be recycled. But when, when the opportunity is made available, say, for example, you find out that it's possible to um, recycle this material, um, who will be funding that? Will it be Santa Rosa County, Escambia County, or will it be PP? No, there wouldn't be no cost to the county or the state on this. I will, okay. I will, I will say that. I, we have to make sure that it is financially feasible as a company to do it and that it is, uh, you know, safe. So we will look at that uh, in terms of the whole process. But no, there should be no cost to the, to the county or the state for this work. I mean, right. the alternative is to put in the landfill, and I just think we're just, as a company, trying to avoid filling up landfills right now. Well, the alternative was to leave it in the ground, but that's just me. Yeah. The one thing I will mention back to the Corex is that, and, and I'm certainly not an expert in this area, but there have been some studies to show that the Corex disperses that were put out at the well site, both subsurface and on the surface, break down naturally within a couple of days. So although I can't promise this, my expectation is by the time that weathers and gets to the beaches and then gets to the landfills, and, and certainly there could be some testing done, but my guess is that most of the Corex material is not, no longer present. Darryl? Just, well, just a quick follow-up. We have sample for the dispersant in um, the waters, and we got our first results back, and it was non-detect. Um, and, and what Chris is saying is there's a breakdown of the chemicals that are in Corexit, and our scientists in Tallahassee are telling us that the lifespan of those contaminants or those chemicals, um, I don't know. I'm sorry? I'm not sure what the exact date it is, but when you look at the time the oil it takes, well, okay, 28 days. Um, it, by the time the oil gets out of the well or into the water and it has made it over to Florida, our scientists did not expect to see anything just because that breakdown would have occurred. Okay. So. Um, what about the on the beach? Ma'am, if you could come to the, to the uh, mic, please. Thank you. Um, what about the reports of the core exit being sprayed on the beaches, aerial spraying? We've heard reports of that. I have no, no knowledge of any spraying of, of any kind of dispersants on beaches at all. I don't know where that report would have come from. And uh, me either. Anybody? We were asked this question yesterday, and we went back to Incident Command, and there we have no reports of aerial spraying on the beaches or near shore. There are no reports so far? Well, that's comforting. Well, actually, I can say there have been reports. There have been, there's <laughs> not been any verified we have not been able to verify that that has occurred and, I have and received, we have looked and i've received a couple of emails as well and and when i asked to you know please send me plane identification or something that we can check into i do not get a response so i think it's in my opinion i think there's reports out there but when i ask for more details to try to check into it i've not received anything back okay okay well thank you for that and um i have one last question on that, uh, commissioner gooden uh, chair of the Santa Rosa County Board was in contact pretty much on a daily basis with R Secretary Soul, mm -hmm. and, and no dispersants were allowed through DEP on any Florida beaches. Okay, and well, that's comforting. I'm not, no, I've not known that to be changed at any certain point in time. Uh, okay, well, it's important to know where these. Well, and, and I brought up the question this information whether the county from. should invest in a, a small quantity of dispersants for our own usage rather than waiting for 
uh, state or, or BP to respond? What if we get in a situation on a county level and a commissioner has to basically make a call on whether or not we do this? And that has been my understanding all along that uh, the department has not allowed dispersants on Florida waters or beaches. Okay, thank you. We have anybody else? Any other questions for pretty much this side of the table, I guess. All right, we're going to move on. Uh, Daryl Boudreaux, Assistant Director of Northwest District Department of Environmental Protection. You have a few comments? Sure, and I'll, I'll make them quick because I know you all probably have general questions. Just first off, I know there's been a lot of frustration with communication. This, this From the time this bill occurred up until now, it's been a real frustrating issue, not only for local governments, the cities, the counties, and DEP and, and the whole process. Uh, the good news is it's getting better. I'm not sure if you all are aware, I know the counties are, that we have set up forward branch commands. And what those are designed to do is to have the local governments on a day-to-day -day basis sit with BP, the Coast Guard, and DEP um, to discuss more local issues as far as what kind of impacts are we seeing locally and, and you know, how to respond. They've been set up for Escambia County, handles Escambia County and Santa Rosa County. Destin handles Okaloosa and Walton counties. Panama City handles Bay County. And then Port St. Joe handles Gulf, Franklin. I think that's it. <laughs> trying to, I think there's three counties they cover. We'll call it in Jefferson. In Jefferson. Well, there's, there's we'll really it haven't, Jefferson. yeah, it will handle Wakulla, but there's really nothing been over that far yet. So that's been a good, um, step forward as far as we're concerned is communication. I think it's working out fairly well. I, I'll leave it to the commissioners to say how, what, you, what you think about it, but I, I, it's, it's greatly improved. From what yeah, we have. <laughs> absolutely. That's the good news is we are getting better. And, and that's one of my main points that I wanted to make is we, this has been a learning process for everyone involved and, and very frustrating, but it's because we've not been, at, you know, sitting at the table before in this, in this manner. And so the good news is we are getting better. And, and I think if, if uh, it happens to South Florida, gets down there, we've set and wrote a very good chapter, I think, on how to respond. You know, um, so having said that, I'm not going to to get back into stuff that the um, EPA has already covered. I did want to tell you, as far as water quality, we've been doing a lot of water quality analysis, and what our analysis tells us, almost without exception, is the impacts to our waters are, the, are what you can see, meaning the, the sheen, the tar balls, and the moose. I think there's been very few results, one or two that I'm aware of, where we actually picked up a petroleum contaminant in the water itself. And, and I'm kind of stuttering here, but if you see a tar ball and we sampled right next to it, there was no petroleum contaminants in the water sample itself other than that tar ball. So that's been a very good, um, very good news as far as I'm concerned. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you, Derek. I was wondering, where are the, where's the, the, the testing sites? Are you all in the Gulf of Mexico, Bio Chico, Pensacola Bay? Could you tell we, the group a little bit about where exactly you're testing? Sure. It's been, um, and if you go to our website, you'll be able to, to see it, because I, I, I can't tell you exactly where and along sure. the beach. But I can tell you, generally speaking, it's along the coastline. So uh, Perdido Key, Pensacola Beach. There has been a sampling point to the west of the Navy base, kind of just within the pass and, and, and across. Um, and those are sampled every week. Um, we're trying to hit the swimming areas to make sure that the water quality is good. Now, of course, the frustration with that is when you take a water quality sample, it takes three days to get the results back. So by the time we know if there's anything in the water, of course, it's three days ago. So from a prediction standpoint, it doesn't really help you. You know, if I go swimming today, am I going to be exposed to anything? Having said that, the results are telling us that if you see tar balls, the tar balls are what the contamination is, not the water around it. So I think that has been a good thing. Um, the, yes, sir. So, so a follow up to that is we can tell our citizens in this community that if they go swimming at Casino Beach, that the water there is relatively safe. If they don't see tar balls and, and the moose and the sheen. I mean, that's my bottom line. It's our sampling. We've not picked it up other than there's one or two <laughs> times when we picked up a petroleum contaminant. Um, Actually, we sampled, let's say this is the tar ball. We sampled right next to it. The water was clean. We took another sample. I believe it was a meter away, and that actually had low levels, and I don't remember what the, what the contaminant was, but low levels. It did not exceed a, a health standard, um, but we did pick it up. And so that actually could be, you know, a boat had, could, could have gone by, and if you have an outboard motor, you've seen the sheen that 
a lot of those create as well. So it could have been anything not necessarily related to the, to the tarball itself. Does that make sense? Now, the West Florida sampling that they're doing, uh, what they do is sample for alkanes, which is a, a chemical, and it, it's a set of chemicals, actually, and they have fingerprinted this, the oil, light, sweet crude oil signature for alkanes. And when they do their sampling, because they sample daily and get the results back in a day, um, they then compare that alkane si signature, and if it's the same signature as, an, as the known sweet like crude, they'll report a detection, you know, of a, uh, when, you, when you see their report, you'll see non-detect or 20 ppm of crude oil. And that's a, basically it's a surrogate or a, you sample for this knowing it has a relationship to this. And so that's what their sampling is doing. Now it won't tell you, you know, is it benzene, is it xylene, is it toluene? It just says this alkane has the same fingerprint as, as a known oil alkane. They would have to run the three-day test to say, is, are there any specific uh, contaminants in it? Does it make sense? More or less, <laughs> it's trying to, trying to boil it down. Um, but the bottom line is, yes, the water is, is, uh, is good from what we have seen, but if you see tar balls, obviously don't swim with the tar balls. It's kind of like, don't play with the dolphins, don't swim with the tar balls. Um, we are continuing the SCAT reviews and basically the, what that sound stands for shoreline cleanup assessment uh, team. And those are teams that are made up of BP, the Coast Guard and DEP. Uh, they ride the beaches every day looking for impacts. And the process is they go out first thing in the morning, they ride the beach, and when they identify an area that has oil impacts, they report it back and the cleanup crews are dispatched to go clean that oil off the beach. That will continue just because the, the, the well is capped right now. We're not saying, whew, and walking away because there is a lot of oil out in the Gulf and um, we don't know for how long we will continue to see impacts, but the SCAT reviews will continue to, to make sure when they, they hit these shores, if they hit the shores, that we know about it and they're cleaned up. The, the phase we're also starting to kick off is another acronym, NERDA, which is Natural Resource Damage Assessment. And what that is designed to do is look at the actual environment itself, not just is there oil there, but what has the, the impact or has there been an impact from that oil on the environment. So are we seeing die, you know, die backs in seagrass or salt marsh or, you know, has it impacted the actual environment? Um, those reviews are starting now as well. And then we will use that information compared to the baseline that we, that we established. And we'll be looking, of course, to BP to, to fund the restoration activities to get us back to where we were. Um, so that will continue. Uh, I think the only other thing I want to tell you about was Actually, I think that was it. I think if you have other questions for me, let me know. But I want to just throw out those key hot points from, a, from, a, from where we are and where we're going. One thing you brought up is restoration of any seagrass and, and uh, the quantification. And this is certainly opinion. We, we've already had this council stood up, Bay Area Resource Council. It's been involved in seagrass restoration, different projects, uh, you know, with uh, stormwater runoff, different things. Very familiar with all the Bay Area resources that we have. Uh, I'm emphasizing that through this budget cycle to both our uh, Board of Commissioners, to the Escambia County Board of Commissioners, and also to the city councils of the uh, municipalities that are involved, the urgency in continuing funding Bay Area Resource Council. In, in your opinion, does this give us a better go-to person, I guess, uh, for these type of restorations. I, my thoughts are why, why reinvent the wheel? We've got this council stood up. If uh, they can reach out to, you know, to DEP, EPA, BP, whoever it is for restoration, or you reach out to us to manage uh, grant dollars or restoration dollars, uh, I'd just like some emphasis put on maintaining this council for those purposes. Oh, absolutely. In fact, it, it's, it's, in, on a similar note, we've got a restoration section within the district that we, we go out and, and get grants and act, we work with Mary and, 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 um, and Bark and, and West Florida Regional Planning Council uh, for years, getting those grants and the stormwater projects. And, and actually our granters have put it all on hold for right now because they don't want us 
restoring habitat, creating habitat that may be impacted. So actually all of our grants are, are now on hold and we'll be looking to kick those back up once the, you know, the, it's under control and the impacts are no longer um, a factor. So I, I absolutely will keep working with you because it's, we've worked in the past, it's worked well and, and you're exactly right, why reinvent the wheel? We wanna, we already have a network that's established and people that know what they're doing. I had a question for you. So you're saying that um, if these tar, bar, tar balls are in the water and you find them in the water, like at Casino Beach, should Bob West shut down the beach in that area for a period of time? And if so, how long should that period of time be? That's a tough question. I can tell you when we were doing our first demonstration on the beach that we looked out, we went out first thing in the morning, okay, where's the impact so that we could actually do a demo? And uh, the beach was really clean. And in fact, you looked out in the water and it was beautiful. And like, you know, my memory of Pensacola Beach always is. Walked down the beach looking for impacts, about five minutes later got back to the pier and then it was scattered with tar balls. So I think the problem is that there's really no way to go in the morning and say the beach is closed based on seeing tar balls or the beach is open based on there's no tar balls because things change and things change relatively quickly. My, my guidance would be from a closing the beach perspective is if you go to the beach with your family or with your friends and you see tar balls, you know, don't go in the water. If there are no tar balls and you go out in the water, I would also keep an eye out because, again, I've personally experienced the fact that it can change pretty darn quickly. Well, you know, I'm in the water almost daily in right. my business and everything that I do, and I see tar balls almost daily in right. the water, you know, uh, scattered you know, here and there. And uh, so it's just, that's the reason I was very concerned about that because that's the first time I've heard you know, any statement, hey, if you do see tar balls, you know, mainly people say, hey, just avoid them or, you know, don't pick them up, you know, call somebody, but right. not to evacuate the water if you see it. Well, I mean, it's kind of like you never know when they're going to be there. And when you're out on the beach and you know the waves, you know, if you get oil on you, is one tar ball going to going right. to hurt you? I mean, it's right. like when you fill you set the car up with gas. I mean, nine times out of ten, I get gas on me. Right. Now, obviously, it's not something that you want to do constantly. Um, so it's an exposure issue. So why would you go out in the water without being careful right now knowing those tar balls are out there? I guess that was my point, is you just want to keep an eye out because I don't want to go out swimming on the beach and get tar balls all, all over me. I had to clean them off and it's, you know, it's a mess. Does that, I don't know if I'm answering your question, yeah, but yeah, it's, it, it, you're answering my question. I mean, they have tar ball clean stations all up and down the beach, but it's right. not that they're saying, hey, if you see one, you, know, you don't go in the water. You know, right. saying, hey, if you get something on you, clean it up. Right. You know, so I just want to make sure that we're clear on what point we're trying to. And the only point I'm making is if you don't want to get oil on you, if you see tar balls, don't go out there. That's I mean, I've changed my oil all my life. You know, I get oil on me. You know, right. I'm sure Bob's had a little bit of oil on him over the years. <laughs> okay. All right. Fine. Any questions for Mr. Boudreaux? Uh, Come up to the mic. Okay, sorry. It's, it's not so much a so question. Your cousin. Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> By marriage. <laughs> yes. Oh, so what are you trying to say? <laughs> it's the French and the English, you know. <laughs> um, it, it, it was more a suggestion. Obviously, um, some of us feel you shouldn't be on the beaches at all if there's the presence of oil in any way, shape, or form. Um, but for those of us that do, an idea might be to, just as we see jellyfish in the water, somebody notify a lifeguard and maybe they can put a flag up for a while or something. I don't know. You know, I mean, it's not... It, it gets down to using common sense. Right. My wife was born and raised here, spent a lot of time on Johnson Beach as a young, you know, child with her family, and, and remembers back... In the, in the 50s and 60s, you could walk along the beach and get get a tar ball on the bottom of your foot. Mm -hmm. so, and certainly, as JB said, if you know a lot of us, I'm a mechanic by trade. I get a bunch of oil on me every day. I'm not as concerned as much about the oil product on us as, as what's been used as a dispersant uh, causing any problems. But it's it's just going to get down to common sense. If there's a big you know sheen out there, then certainly. You know, I would suggest stay away from it and, and possibly, like you said, uh, tell a lifeguard that you've seen a large, large area that, of concern where they can quantify if it is actually a sheen or, or just sea grasses or something. So I think, you know, err on the side of caution, but I, I, I don't see any reason to, to close vast areas of beaches either. So. That's, well, I'm, I'm not going to make any comment on that, but thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Garcia. 
how ready. Any comments? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. We'll move on down to now. We have uh, folks here from Wildlife Sanctuary of Florida, Northwest uh, Regional Director of Florida Wish, Fish and Wildlife, and also uh, Senior Research Scientist for FWC Fish and Wildlife Research. So we're going to kind of go to that side of the table now, and uh, I'm going to start out uh, with, uh, let me start with Mr. Robertson, please. And, and uh, we have a couple of slides. Here. All right, you yeah. working together? Yes. yes. Oops, okay. Mr. Robinson and Mr. Henderson will. And then Dorothy Kaufman. Uh, and Dorothy. Okay. So I'm not trying to skip anybody, just kind of bracket everybody together here. Would you like me to begin hey, while he's getting that yeah. set up? Okay. Um, Again, my name is Louis Robertson. I'm the regional director for the Northwest Region for Florida Fish and Wildlife. Um, can everybody hear all right? Coming through all right there? Thank you. Go ahead, Louis. What I didn't say earlier, uh, I'm a Pensacola native, so this is coming home for me. Um, I'm, our regional office is over in Panama City. But uh, as far as the involvement with the commission, I mean, it's been from the top down. We've all played a part or, or at least some type of role. Um, our commission itself uh, came to Pensacola back in June, held a public meeting here at the beach and uh, actually got a firsthand tour and, and look at the issues here. And the commission also just recently has changed its regularly scheduled meeting in, this, in South Florida and we'll be moving that back up here to Pensacola in uh, September 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. So our commissioners all the way down have been involved in this issue uh, from day one. Um, and as, as all from our executive director's office, our law enforcement officers, our biologists, our fisheries, uh, both terrestrial and fisheries uh, end of things, and our research scientists like George, who's been embedded at the incident command. And let me say, our partners uh, at uh, DEP have been the lead state agency for this spill. We work at their direction and and, um, and we also are working under the incident command system. So uh, we received all the things we do are, are directed and and approved and, and, and so forth under the incident command. Uh, you probably, if you're here in Pensacola, you know that FWC is here. Um, boats and helicopters and uh, ATV patrols, the, the SCAP patrol early in the mornings were part of, of all that. So um, again, we're going to be back here in uh, September for a meeting here at the Hyatt there on Pensacola Beach. So uh, invite you to, no, I'm sorry, the Hilton. I meant to, got the wrong hotel. Um, but anyway, I'm going to turn it over now to George to get into a little more detailed discussion about our efforts and uh, our response. Thank you, Louie. Thank you for uh, having us today. I'm going to try to uh, just bring you up to speed very quickly on, on really what's a very multidimensional role that the uh, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission has played. And, it, and the role actually started as the DEP's role uh, long before the spill. The, uh, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission in, in uh, concert with the uh, Department of Environmental Protection and the United States Coast Guard was responsible for building the area contingency plan, which formed the basis for the initial response. The Fish and Wildlife Commission, in, in fact, uh, has worked primarily with District 7 of the Coast Guard, which is everything up to Taylor County, and the Panhandle is part of the Mobile District. Uh, but we, we did the area contingency plan. We, the state of Florida, built the area contingency plan for the states of Mississippi and Alabama so that there'd be one uh, continuous and, and uh, interchangeable uh, response plan. Uh, to be totally honest, the size of this spill sort of overwhelmed uh, anybody's uh, anticipation of, of what would happen, but it provided an, an excellent base, and it's the base from which we're still working. It had already had listed uh, sensitive areas. It already had listed uh, lots, most of the boat ramps. Uh, a lot of the information is also available in these Escambia and Santa Rosa County boaters guides for this particular area, uh, which uh, contain a lot of the information in, in uh, a, a form more readily accessible to the uh, general public. 
And so those were very important tools right when the spill first started and, and everybody, we started a lot quicker than we, than we would have, believe it or not. Uh, in this bill, this, the state, I don't know who that guy on the left is, but this guy down on the, in the lower right is Dave Palandro, and he's the chief uh, scientific support coordinator for the, for the state, uh, and he's, he's doing what you mostly do during spills, is you manipulate data, you, you take information from other people and put it back out in, in a form that, that's useful and helpful. We're primarily building plans, responding to situations, and then getting out in the field and, and checking and seeing whether the boom strategies were good or, or the uh, beaches are clean or the uh, sea turtles aren't being impacted. And those are the three things I'm primarily going to talk about uh, as we go along. One of the very important things, and I really can't emphasize enough that this is a partnership with not only with DEP, but also with the National Guard, uh, with the Coast Guard in, in doing the, the aerial uh, activities. But there's been heads up digitization of building the maps of where the oil is as we go along. Uh, it's been a, an incredibly useful tool uh, in terms of understanding where the oil is so that, that we can respond. It's one of the first times on a really large scale that the, we've been able to use electronic mapping uh, to, to not just be a gee whiz tool, but actually a response tool. Uh, I'm going to uh, jump around. I didn't have much of a chance to prepare these slides, so it's a little bit choppy, and I apologize for that. Um, some of the other things that we have done, and as we go along, we'll, I'll talk about a few more things uh, in terms of wildlife towards the end, but the management of the state of Florida's waters related to fisheries. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the fact that the, the federal government closed the vast area of the Gulf of Mexico, it's one time greater than 40% of the Gulf of Mexico is actually closed to fishing. Uh, the state, uh, in the end of June, closed uh, what amounts to 200 square miles of, uh, of the area. And if, if you look at this is the closed area, this particular area is the water tower out to state waters back to the Alabama, Florida line. So you can see it's just this little dot in there uh, is the Florida closure. The state has already collected in the week of uh, July 16th, uh, we used uh, two different platforms, went out and collected the necessary fish and uh, uh, invertebrates, shrimp and crabs, that we thought would uh, uh, properly evaluate if the, the areas with the fish were contaminated at all. We honestly don't believe the fish were ever contaminated. We closed the area uh, out of concern. You'll see another slide after this, with some of the aerial pictures. You can see there was heavy sheen out there. Uh, so we, we close it out of, out of precautions, and it's a lot harder to, when, you, when your caution go, level goes down, it's a lot harder to reopen. Uh, but those samples are all analyzed now, and the results are supposed to come in from the Pascagoula uh, Fisheries Lab of the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, by the end of the week, and so we'll know whether uh, it's appropriate to uh, reopen this area. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Henderson, let me make sure I understood you correctly. You said that the fish that, that they haven't been impacted, as, as best that you can tell? No, I said that we closed this, this fishery because we didn't want people consume, potentially consuming fish that might be contaminated. And you're still waiting on the, you've got some, you're waiting we, on those we, results. We collected the necessary fish necessary to make the evaluation and the, uh, and, however, it's the FDA in their Pascagoula Fisheries Lab in conjunction with the National Marine Fisheries Service that does the testing. They finished that testing, um, today's Wednesday. They finished that testing this morning, mm -hmm. if I understand correctly, uh, and, the, and the results will be available to us by the end of the week. And at that time, the commission will be in a position to, to make a recommendation to either reopen the area or not reopen it, there's a potential that they might not reopen it until the federal government has an opportunity to, to reassess some of their additional, their areas that are still closed. The area, the, uh, see this area down here was closed until last week, right. and, the, and the federal government just reopened it. Well, they're assessing, you know, how, you know, can they reopen to where here? And if the state can be, uh, congruent or at least concurrent with the, with the Fed reopening. The Feds are only going to be a couple of days behind. Rather than opening up a little bit and saying, okay, you guys, here's the imaginary line, do not cross it, 
It'd be a lot easier on law enforcement and the fishermen if if they you know could could cross the imaginary line called state waters here and not get into trouble with the, the federal government. So the, if it looks like it'll be several weeks, then we'll open anyway. If 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 the tests say to open, uh, if it, if it looks like it's going to happen, you know, within a few days, we'll probably wait until the uh, to the the federal government also acts so that we have a, a clear message that doesn't confuse fishermen. Okay. Thank you. So one of the other things that we're doing, and, and unfortunately the light is on this picture, but you can see the sheen that's cutting across the, uh, the, the top picture. We're doing some aerial mapping. That's not important, sir. It won't last that long. <laughs> I'm quicker than that. I'll show you a different sheen. The, uh, this is, you know, just, it's light. Where's my pointer? There it is. Just light streaming oil. This is very. This is a thin sheen. It's what primarily has been seen when you've been doing these aerial reconnaissance flights. It's what gets interpreted. It's also what um, anybody who's familiar with flying over the the, the waters. It can be produced uh, uh, biogenically, algae and a variety of other uh, uh, phenomena in the in the open ocean can create. Uh, very thin reflective sheens of this of this nature, so that it, it does take trained observers, uh, and and once we observe something like that, the trained observer will map it out, and the uh, and then they'll go back and call primarily FWC law enforcement's uh, uh, heavy boats, the uh, Orion or some of our smaller craft, and they'll go out to the site to, to verify before we start uh, dispersing the slower. Uh, VUs, which are, are sh primarily shrimp boats that have been modified to collect oil or directing a, a Coast Guard uh, asset to go over here to skim oil. We want to make sure that it is oil. And so we, we'll confirm that with, with uh, water-bound based resources. And this is all, we try to do this all in pretty tight conjunction with the, uh, with the incident command and certainly with the Coast Guard. I want to go back to this, this slide. The, the, this is, this is a, one of the FWC law enforcement people on that morning scat beach patrol looking, looking for oil. They actually do it three times a day, so it's not all at 6 o'clock in the morning. And sometimes, you know, there's already uh, other people out enjoying the beach. But one of the things I want to point out is that this, this guy is operating sort of the way the guidelines tell him to, to that has the least impact to the biological resources associated with, with the beach community. He's not, he's driving where, between low and high tide, basically, uh, and staying out of the dune system, out of the rack, and there's a variety of reasons for that, and I'm about to get to them. Uh, we've spent a lot of time since it's become apparent that we needed to clean the beaches as expeditiously as possible, even though it was not necessarily the best thing to do for the sea turtles, the nesting birds, uh, or some of the other uh, wildlife, including beach mice that uh, happen to uh, be endemic to the area. So we made an effort to pick up tar balls. And, and you can see that that's a tar ball, that's a shell. That's a tar ball, that's a shell. You know, this is a tar ball, that's a tar ball, that's a tar ball. This is actually a fairly heavy uh, tar balling <laughs> uh, on the beach. Most of the time, you didn't get this density of, of tar balls. That's not to say that they weren't having an impact, because they, clearly they were. Uh, we were attempting to clean these up by a variety of methods, including hand cleaners, both day and night, and, and beach equipment. And you can see from this picture, um, the, on the right, it was a beach cleaner went through, and he, he may or may not have picked up uh, tar balls. I, I can assure you that he actually did. Uh, but you can see that he left some, some there. Uh, this was a, the same beach cleaner, but it was later in the day when the, when the oil had heated up and you got smears. It was one of the reasons that most of the mechanical equipment uh, went to uh, nighttime operations for, for a bit of time to try to avoid having this kind of a, of a smear. The, the oil did not immediately um, uh, uh, flush out of the sand, and so, so we didn't want to, want to do that. Although over time, surf washing it would probably have a, beneficial effect. Um, so you can see that, that these are the kind of tar balls, even after the cleaning, that the pickers are picking, <laughs> uh, the, your, your beach cleaners. 
And they're, they're doing that day and night now. And the more these, the sand, this, these tar balls have been worked into the sediment, actually the harder they get, the, the less runny, uh, the less uh, biologically active from it. They don't have much of a smell when you pick them up. Although nobody would ever do this because you have to wear your gloves because it's toxic material, right? Um, you, you'll find you know, that it doesn't even leave a sheen on your fingers. You know, working on your car is a heck of a lot dirtier job. And the, uh, but, but those are the things we we're trying to clean up. And we're tr we have to do that trying to be responsive to the, the fact that we have some critical nesting habitats for birds and for, for sea turtles. And one of the things we're doing with sea turtles uh, is because of the concern for the turtles potentially going out into the oil, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, along with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, have, have, a, have a plan to, that's been approved by the Unified Command to move the turtles from nests in Alabama and uh, Florida over to the east coast of Florida just before they hatch so that they're not released into the oil. And as the oil in the system goes down, now that the well is stopped, uh, there'll be a continuing reevaluation of the, the need for that program, because there's obviously pluses and minuses to both of those things. But yes, sir, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a turtle lover. Um, I can tell you Buck Lee's probably tired of getting calls from me on every development that happens on Santa Rosa Island when I ask him if there's been turtle-friendly turtle lighting uh, used on those new developments. But I have a question um, about um, relocating eggs. Um, I was, was under the impression that uh, that, that uh, turtles go back to where um, wh where they were uh, hatched or, or where the eggs were laid. Now, how how does that affect that 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 issue there? It, I'm not probably not making myself. You know, I understand completely what you're saying. Yeah, right. But is that true, or is that just a myth? Uh, what, tell me a little bit about that and how that process will be affected. All right, I'll, I'll give you the answer first. We don't know how that process will be affected. The, the fact of the matter is that sea turtles do have some site fidelity. The female lays uh, eggs on a, on a beach, on an area of beach. Uh, let's consider it the panhandle. It's a pretty big area there that they're have, they return to. Uh, after 25 or so years, 20 for some species, 30 for others, they come back to nest. Now, the turtle that left was, you know, just a little bit bigger than a silver dollar when it, when it left. Uh, and somehow, uh, 150 pounds later, uh, it finds a, the same or similar beach. Whether it gets that cue to return to that beach because of the period of time it spent in the nest, in the sand, in that nest, uh, or whether it gets it as it comes out of the nest and, it, and in its frenzy swims to the sea, somehow the magnetic uh, twist of the earth as well as the stars, position of the stars affects it. Uh, it those are the two extremes. We're, we, uh, the scientists who made this decision, uh, are hoping that most of the imprinting is associated with the time spent in the nest and that magnetic fluxes that are, are present in, in the ground while they're developing uh, eggs, more than in the 25 second, you know, flight to the sea. So, so that they're hoping that if, if the turtles survive, remember only one in a hundred turtles survive anyway under good conditions, they're pretty confident, they're very confident that we'll get good hatch from the eggs that would hatch when we move them over to the East Coast, because we're harvesting them uh, just a couple of days before they get ready to, to hatch. And by doing it then, the, you know, you can shake the eggs and, and not kill the embryos. Whereas if you were moving them when they're only a couple of days old, uh, they're very susceptible to rolling just like a, a chicken egg is, just like addling a chicken egg. And, uh, and that passes when the eggs are older. There's also some benefits to leaving them in the native beach because the the future sex of the turtles are determined in large part by the temperatures at which they're incubated. Yeah. And within the turtle nest itself, there are different temperature layers associated uh, with the strata in the nest, because there's eggs on top of each other. So there's some self-generated heat. And these are pretty subtle 
uh, temperature differences we're talking about. And see, already science is getting getting boring here. But the uh, <laughs> so 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 you want to leave them in the nest as long as possible. We think once they get to the east coast, they might come back. And even if they don't come back, it was the decision of the endangered species people that the turtles on the in the panhandle of Florida and the turtles that are on the east coast of Florida are on in the same recovery group, in the same bigger picture, in the bigger picture, picture of survival of turtles, uh, that they were in the same group. And so that any survival, even if they never came back to, to Pensacola, was better than the risk of going out into the oil. Because <laughs> even, even as the oil gets less and less, where the oil will be, will be associated with weed lines and convergences. Uh, as you fishermen know, they're out there, the sargassum and the, and those, that also collects oil as well as turtles. So yeah, it's, a, it's a big trade-off, and that's a long answer to a short question. Well, no, I, I don't think it's boring at all, and I think we probably have many turtle lovers in the uh, audience today. But uh, thank you very much. I'd like you maybe later on talk about the losses of turtles that, uh, that uh, we've experienced because of this disaster as this goes along, if you don't mind. Thank you. I'll, I'll see what I can do about that. And okay. anyway, but back to driving and being on the beach <laughs> day or night. Uh, just those impacts with all those ATVs, and, and I'll be remiss if I don't tell you that there was more than one complaint about, uh, you know, uniformed uh, officers driving ATVs inappropriately. There's been more than one complaint about uh, uh, contractors cleaning up the beach using their vehicles inappropriately as it relates to both bird and turtle habitat. And so we're constantly educating, re-educating, and, and in some cases, uh, de debunking myths about, about activities. Uh, but you can see, well, we got a picture, somebody crushed a turtle, and, uh, and we, we don't want that to happen, so it is really critical. And this is something that, one of the things that I've spent a lot of time doing in the incident command at least a month ago when, when we were in the height of we got to clean the beaches, was working with the people in operations uh, to make sure that uh, we did it well. And, and these are cryptic. You can't see because of the light. Again, this, this woman's sandal, well, she has a very pretty toenail. She's about to crush an egg, uh, which looks as, as much like a shell as just about anything else that you can see in that picture. But that's a little. And this, this uh, least turn is a perfectly healthy, fully formed, and, and uh, uh, well camouflaged baby bird. Uh, so you can see that, that they're cryptic. And one of the things that the baby birds don't do, because they are cryptic, which means that they have a lot of ca natural camouflage, is they're not trained to run away. They're trained to freeze. Hmm. So it's, you know, you freeze in front of, a, of an ATV, you're a dead little bird. It would be better to run away, but that's not their survival characteristic. Their survival characteristic was to be camouflaged, and the, and the bobcat will walk right past you. And now this is back to the sea turtle nesting. And, and uh, yes, we, we are moving the nest. It's a, a critical process. Uh, and we think that it's probably a, a good idea. Now, it's just a, a real brief summary. And I haven't done, done justice to half the things that the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission is doing. And, and I certainly uh, can, cannot emphasize enough that it is it's a, it's a big partnership. The BP has a part in it. EPA has a part in it. The, uh, uh, U.S. Department of Interior, which is the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Parks, you all know about the national parks around here, uh, as well as the state agencies, primarily DEP and the uh, State Emergency Management Office, uh, as well as FWC, have, have played in, in trying to keep the problems that we're experiencing here to a minimum and those problems that we do have to get them cleaned up as quickly as possible. And with that, I'll close and I ask you if you have any questions. Okay. How come, if, with the amount of dispersants they're saying that they're, that they're putting out there, how come we haven't seen, or have we had a lot of big fish kills? I haven't seen a lot of fish kills on the beach, or has there been any reported of large fish kills? Uh, there, there have not been reports of large fish kills. Um, the, I have to say, dispersants are not very toxic. The dispersed oil is much more toxic than the dispersants alone. And the oil will disperse naturally with or without the, the toxins. The enemy here is, is definitely the, the oil. 
The, the fact that we've used you know, almost a million and a half gallons of dispersant is definitely a, a, a lot of material. Maybe we've used two million gallons by now. The fact that we've used several hundreds of thousands of gallons of it um, you know, in, in a not labeled use, using it in the sub, subsurface you know, at 5,000 feet, that has obviously has implications for the behavior of that oil but we don't know very much about the behavior of the oil by itself when it's released in these kinds of volumes from 5,000 feet, because the oil is not a chemical. The oil is a complex mixture of chemicals. The alkanes are one of them, the PAHs are another one, the, the volatile organics are, are another one. It's a whole big mixture. And all the dispersant uh, by itself does is create a, a, the Dawn liquid effect. It, it is merely a surfactant. It lets the oil you know, blend more quickly into the water. By blending it more quickly into the water, we definitely put it more in the water column to be more toxic to aquatic organisms and less on the surface to be less toxic to, to birds and some of the other uh, animals that, that might come in contact with it and, and keep a lot of it off the beach. Back to the fish kill. We haven't seen the fish kills. Uh, we haven't had de depressed DOs. The bigger impact is suspected to be among the larval and juvenile fish, the very small organisms that are much more sensitive at lower levels of oil than fully grown you know, bluefin tuna. We may have wiped out a whole bunch of little bluefin tuna that, you've never, that you'll never see, but we didn't wipe out any big bluefish tuna. So we, you were saying we just, we just haven't had it, so it hasn't been as toxic as we thought it would be that, that for the fish kill? Is I think it's been just as, as um, it, it had, it's, I, I never expected a fish kill. I'm a fishery scientist. Uh, I would only have expected a fish kill if we had gotten a large amount of oil into a confined area, uh, and then that kill would have been as much associated with, with DO. That would be a, a fish kill you can see. The, the, uh, the dissolved oxygen. Yeah. These guys know like DO. <laughs> like the old L wise in the, in the bayou when they used to. But, but the, but the, but the, I'm sorry. I was getting comfortable. I'll get back in the hot seat. The, um, the mortality that, that, that I anticipate, and I've been involved with oil spills before, has to do with the early life history of the organisms. It has to do with the pieces of their life history that are generally not observed. It's the, less it's the age zero and age one year classes that that are at highest risk and and to be totally honest with you i have not seen the data yet that lets me draw the the conclusion that this dose for this amount of time dose response uh was uh present in area x like right off of of Pensacola or out where the red snapper were spawning. Uh, I'd, that data will come and it will be analyzed, but it's all going to be, um, you know, hindcast and modeled uh, information. It's very difficult to study several hundred thousand cubic uh, meters of, of uh, ocean for larval organisms and then uh, count them. And it's really frustrating for us as well as for you all. I have one more question. Is there any way to narrow the amount of vehicles on the beach? I mean, it's, it's unbelievable the amount of vehicles driving up and down that beach right now. To me, it seems like they're doing more damage than almost the oil is because of the, uh, I mean, there's, every guy's got his own ATV he's driving up and down. Do you have I agree with you completely. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, there are. Yes. No. Oh no. There are there is a lot of efforts, and in fact, the as today, be, because the oil is going down, the the anxiety is going down, and the for instance, the branch one, which is Santa Rosa and and Escambia County, uh, the branch one of the response, which is now responsible for putting beach cleaners on on the beaches, you know, has cut the number of beach cleaners um, by about a third in the last couple of days. And they'll continue to try to 
move those numbers down. Um, for a while, um, uh, Walton County, it might have been Okaloosa, I'm not, I'm not sure right now, but it was right off of Destin. It was one or the other. They were putting hundreds and thousands, well, they were putting a thousand people out at night, coming back with, with uh, you know, five tar balls. Uh, and they finally have right size. They, they figured out that that's not the most efficient way to do it. It might make people for a little while feel safer, but you know, and they're looking at a, a targeted of 10 people per mile to continue to monitor and clean their beaches and to respond basically to the SCAT reports to put people where they're needed rather than trying to blanket the, the area with, with people. I mean, I've been on, out on the beach at night and the beach cleaners at night have been out there with, you know, kitchen colanders and sieves. And, and I mean, that is just an ineffective way to, to, to manage the system, and it has a lot of wildlife impacts. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know maybe someone from the audience would, or some folks from the audience would like to ask some questions. But um, I, I, uh, I actually witnessed a, an oiled uh, pelican behind my home about uh, a month ago or so, and, uh, and it was uh, captured and, and taken away. I hope it lived. Uh, we named the Pelican DeSoto from the street I live on. But I was wondering, do you have any numbers of, of uh, wildlife, uh, turtles, et cetera, that have, have uh, uh, been destroyed because of this disaster? Well, let's see. My regional director has just given me uh, I'm just curious of turtles and, and, and pelicans and, and the losses that we've had um, in the area. In, in, in this, of as of yesterday, there were 177 recovered alive birds, of which 120 have subsequently died. I say that again. How many? Uh, I'm sorry. There, there was 177 recovered alive oil, visibly oiled wildlife. Of of those, 120 of those died during rehabilitation. 14 have been released, and there are 43 still in rehabilitation. And there were 162 recovered dead that were oiled. So the, the total dead number of birds is 282 for the state of Florida. The, for sea turtles, they've recovered 29 oiled sea turtles. And they've recovered them at sea by go, going out. We had an active program going to, to those sargassum and convergent lines picking up uh, oiled and oiled enough, the, the turtles that are oiled enough that they're slow enough for us to catch them, <laughs> which means they're a pretty slow turtle. Um, and, and of those, uh, one has, 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 has died, and the rest are, are, are still, one has actually been released, and then there's 27 that are still being held until, primarily until we think the conditions are good enough to let them go back into the water here. Hmm. So, so we've recovered. Uh, uh, one one uh, dead turtle as well. So there's been a total of 30 alive or dead, and turtles co collected, and two of them have are dead. One was recovered dead, one died. Uh, and there's been a one or two uh, dolphin that in the area. Thank you. If you have questions, if you, if you will, please come up to the microphone, and I'll need your name and address for our records. Yes, I'm Michael Arth, and I live in Deland, Florida. And I actually just rolled in after 800 miles bicycling the length and the breadth of Florida. And uh, what I've seen along my trip and what I've heard about all of this, he just mentioned 268 birds killed. There, there were almost that many oil rigs that, that collapsed during the 2000s, during the hurricanes we had. I think this is an opportunity to look at the big picture. And the big picture is, is that we don't have a democracy in this country. We've sold off our democracy to the oil companies, and they are the ones who set the policy. Forty years ago, Nixon announced Project Independence to become energy independent. And here we are 40 years later. Think about that. 40 years later, we haven't done a damn thing. We're still the same place we were 40 years ago, except that in 1970, 40 years ago, we reached peak oil. That was our opportunity to turn this ship around. R right now, we could, we could uh, be the energy independent country. Uh, the Sunshine State could be a net, net energy exporter of solar energy. We have hydropower in the Gulf Stream. 0.08% of the energy that flows past our shores 
would supply 100% of Florida's needs. I think we should take this opportunity not to focus so much on this particular tragedy, because every six years we have the equivalent of an Exxon Valdez in our Gulf of Mexico from all the other spills. This is an ongoing tragedy, and it has a solution. We can begin today to demand that we have a real demo a representative democracy in this country, that we no longer sell off our sell off our democracy to the special interests who have determined that our oil policy is going that our energy policy is going to be based on oil. We spend 1.5 trillion dollars a year on our combined military and defense budget. 1.5 trillion dollars. The true cost of gasoline is is over 12 dollars a gallon because of all the subsidies to the oil industry. And all people will talk about is just now we're reaching parity with solar energy and uh, oil, but they're not taking into account this huge subsidy to the oil industry. I think that should stop now. We should really start to take a look at this. And I don't see that in the media. I don't see them talking about that. I see them focusing on BP, this one incident, this, this one tragedy. It's an ongoing tragedy. We're like the, the frog being boiled in the water slowly. We need to take a look at, 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 the, at the big picture. And right now we're looking at the trees, 268 birds. That's what we're looking at instead of the entire planet. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments? Ma'am, please. Hi, my name is Anne Marie Eads. I'm a 16 year resident at, um, in East Hill. My wonder is um, how many birds, dolphins, fish never made that count? What was BP doing siphoning up the dead birds and the dead dolphins before they even got to the count? That's just my thought. All right. Four, please. Please. Uh, my name is Chris White, Chris with a K, and white like the color our beaches used to be. I have a question for you, sir. Um, just a clarification. Um, you said that there's no big fish kills. Do we have underwater documentation, you know, that they're all fine? No, I th actually, I, th I thought I made that fairly clear, that, that the mortalities that, that we have seen are, are, are very few, uh, and, and the in order to document other fish kills, you know, we we are probably going to have to use models and hind casting based on on what amounts to a dose response analysis of what's going on out there. There's thousands of square miles for for animals to to uh, to succumb in and to float to the bottom. Thank in you. This, so that's where all the dead fish are are right now because in, of the two million gallons of Corexit and all of the oil that's in there. Because we all know that what Corexit does, as Dawn dish detergent does, is it breaks it up. And all of the red blood cells of all of those fish that breathe it for more than 96 hours, like the EPA tests, um, just kills them. They can't just come out for a little break after 96 hours. There are millions of fish in there. And I'm having a hard time is um, distinguishing between your fact and opinion. I feel, sir, that you've given a lot of opinions. Um, I, I was very interested in the sea turtles because you spoke with that authoritatively. But to say that there's no big fish kills is absurd. All right, any other comments before we move on? Sir. Kelly Moore, I live in East Hill also. The gentleman, I'd like to reiterate what he said about the, um, th does anybody here know about the spill yesterday? Yes. How many people know about that? Yes. Half the room. It happens all the time. That's like with Katrina, I heard, oh, there was no real damage to the, uh, the oil platforms. There was like 239,000 gallons of oil spilled. Nobody says a word about that. It's not sexy, I guess, like a pipeline out there that's been spewing millions of gallons for 99, well, 100 days today. It's pathetic. Just like what she was just saying about the, you know, you're giving a fish kill. You actually think that 200 and something birds is all this died? No, I, you know, I, I don't think that 
only 200 and something birds have died, and I don't know that there's been a fish kill or not. I do know about the sexual uh, <coughs> development of sea turtles in, in their nests, so I can answer that question factually. Since I haven't observed uh, the mortality of, of all the birds or all the fish, all I can say is that I suspect that there is cryptic mortality, which means mortality that I have not observed. And I think I've said that pretty clearly. Okay, I just got here a little while ago, so I haven't heard everything. What, what? What about porpoises? Does anybody say anything about porpoises dying? Well, the, what, what I said was one has died in Florida that we've recovered, and there's been clear documentation in Louisiana of more than that, but I do not have the Louisiana numbers. Okay, because I heard a talk radio show the other day about they were saying that no porpoises have ever been affected by this oil spill, and I, I remember a picture of somebody holding a three-foot. I don't know if that's the one you're talking about, but they were carrying it on shore, and I'm sure it died from natural reasons in the last three months. And, and I, I just need to clarify that the numbers for, for birds and turtles that I'm talking about were only for Florida. They weren't for Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. Those were only for Florida. There are numbers for Mississippi and Alabama, and there are numbers for Louisiana uh, as, as well. I mean, there are, are multiple state jurisdictions involved here. I was just reporting these okay. bird numbers for Florida. Well, the oil spill's obviously a lot more effective over there than here. So if we've had 260, they probably had 2,060 in each state, and it gets worse as you go west. Anyway, that's all I'd like to say. All right. Anybody else? Comments? Two more. Yep. Right, we got two more, and then we're going to move on. Hi, I'm Barbara Albrecht. I live at 1528 East Brainerd Street in East Hill. I have a question concerning all the sargasm that's being picked up by the BP workers on the beach. You know, the uh, sargassum adds nutrients back to our sandy soils. So how are you looking at that, and how does that play into your contingency plan and your NERDA effects? And how much data has been collected on the Gulf prior to the spill, like two years, five years, ten years ago, for your baseline studies, not just in the last few months since we've had this problem? Thanks. Are were you directing that to BP? Uh, Okay. Maybe, I, I, maybe BP would. Well, are you going to go ahead and right. start? Uh, go ahead. Okay, I, I'll start. Um, the uh, the beach protocols we have discouraged the cleaning of the sargassum uh, from unoiled areas, uh, and and even in areas that are oiled, if they're adjacent to bird nesting areas we have discouraged the cleaning of the sargassum unless it's heavily oiled. Uh, all of those guidelines have not been followed. Uh, it's easier sometimes for a worker to pick up a, a bag than fill it up with sargassum than it is to pick it up and fill it up with oil. Uh, but those are, those are management problems that are, that are being dealt with. The, the sargassum at sea uh, is you know, a natural phenomena. It continues to collect oil. The oil does collect there, and so when sargassum comes ashore, it often has light coatings of oil associated with it, sometimes not so light. To date, we have recommended that unless it's causing visual, visible oiling onto the beach, that it go ahead and be left alone. We recognize it's a very important resource for both the, uh, the, the birds, but also for a variety of other uh, uh, animals that, that use the, uh, the beachfront, including the, uh, the diamondback terrapin. So, so uh, I think that we recognize the concern. Again, it, this is a, you know, whether you all like it or not, and I know I don't like it, this is a disaster. Uh, it is an emergency response, and it does take um, a degree of give and take on, on both sides. And, uh, and that's very unfortunate, but that's the way it is. As to research, there is a lot of research that has been done in the Gulf of Mexico uh, on uh, currents, on uh, algal, algae formation, on fish populations. There is nowhere near as much as we, the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, have asked for in the past to actually document how those systems are functioning. We have uh, been attempting for years to get the necessary funding to better characterize uh, different ecosystems within the open uh, Gulf of Mexico, within the abysmal uh, deep coral communities, uh, 
the, there's a variety of other uh, select and specialized communities. And uh, certainly inshore, we all are aware of the fact that there hasn't been enough resources uh, devoted to just understanding our, our nearshore populations, our seagrasses, or our, our marsh systems. And we would love to have more, more data. And, and I do know that, uh, and I forget exactly who was asking, but the, there was a federal agency, I'm guessing it's probably U.S. Fish and Wildlife, but they were going out to all the local districts and state agencies looking for what data they had to establish that baseline. And as part of our restoration program, we do have some, and we have shipped that on over, and that's going to become the baseline. I mean, it, it's absolutely correct. George is right. We, there's, we always ask for more money for monitoring, and, and it's hard to get money for monitoring in the past 10, 20 years. It's all been about putting acres back out, which I agree with. I mean, you, you want more habitat out there. But that does leave you with a large data gap with exactly what the extent and health of the, of the systems are. But in, in restoring habitat, we have collected data. We, we, are, we do have a better body of knowledge now than we did five years ago. And that is all being consolidated and documented so that we can then do a post analysis and be able to compare the two. As far as water quality, before we were impacted by the oil, we did go out and do a, a series of water quality testing to establish that baseline. It's, um, you had to do that right before because you can't use necessarily five-year-old water quality data and then take a sample either during the event or right after and say, see what it used to be like five years ago? So, we, so in that instance, we did have to take some you know, last-minute sampling, which was done. And that was actually done all across, all across Florida, not just in the Northwest. We have, we have one last question. This lady up, had her hand up. Ma'am? <coughs> might I, might I go? One last question. This lady had her hand up prior to you. Do you want to give the floor to this gentleman? Yes. All right, thank you. Go ahead, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Robert Kugelman. I'm from uh, Vero Beach, Florida, which is on the East Coast. Uh, I came over here uh, the last week of uh, April, having heard about the oil spill. I used to do a lot of camping over in this part of the country. It's one of the most beautiful I'm aware of. I completed the training provided by Escambia County for volunteers. I completed the training provided by, uh, by BP. Uh, I've been working more or less uh, on, the, on the beach since then as a volunteer in the, in the National Park. Uh, I was present when the uh, uh, dolphin was beached. Uh, it was actually the first day that the oil really hit in Pensacola. And I think the thing that really surprised me uh, in watching that is it took about four hours to get that dolphin out of the water. The dolphin was uh, basically held up in the surf and kept alive by uh, an enforcement agent, uh, Kathy Martinez, who was on detail with DEP from uh, Miami, and uh, two, two Coast Guard fellows that happened along. Uh, my job as a volunteer was uh, crowd control. And I think the thing that really struck me was, particularly on reading the press and reading uh, the complaints about the problems of communication is that, you know, since 9-11, this country has spent literally billions of dollars on emergency planning at all levels, federal, state, and local. And uh, one way to look at this oil spill, it's really just a chemical attack. It's the first chemical uh, uh, warfare accident, although it might be necessarily that what it was. And it does seem that the, uh, that the response is not uh, perhaps as efficient as it might have been. And uh, one thing I, I think uh, we would, and I had said this at the Senator Getz's hearing about a week and a half ago, is that we really do invest now, either state or federal, uh, the amount of money that's needed at the front end to conduct the type of evaluation that should be conducted, because this is an unprecedented event. And uh, you know, finger pointing is nice, but uh, at the end of the day, there are some very important lessons to be, to be learned. I do have a question. I didn't come here to give a lecture. I did come up to answer a question. Uh, somebody mentioned, when is it safe to go in the water? The way when campers uh, come up to me and ask me, is it safe to go in the water? Uh, I'm usually pretty confident with the answer because I have stopped the SCAT team and I've asked the SCAT team members uh, how many of them have taken their families uh, swimming in the Gulf within the last week. And I, I, I base my answer to campers based on what they tell me. Very few of them have. Um, the most common question I'm get, getting recently, though, is the residual uh, discoloration of our beaches. They've gone from pure white to kind of tan. And this is after the crews. And these crews are doing a good job. These are people that are out there working. They're incredible weather. 
they're, they're working. They're not just sitting around. They're, they're picking up a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff. But uh, people wonder, will that ever go away? Uh, do we need to use sand separators to, to re-clean the sand, or will it clean itself naturally? And so that's my question. Thank you for the message. Well, I'll let Daryl chime in here, too. So I guess it, it is, the answer is it's an area that's going to be studied. We're going to look at bioremediation uh, applications to accelerate that, if we can. We're going to look at Obviously, we've, uh, and, and I w was going to actually say this in my re remarks, we've had quite an evolution of beach cleaning over the last three months. If you remember when we started out collecting tar balls in the hot middle of the day and trying to run machines, we learned a lot about running machines during the day when tar balls are soft and sticky. And in the early days, we, didn't, we weren't allowed to do night operations. Night operations are much safer for people we have an awful lot of heat stroke victims, a lot of people with chest pains because they're collecting in the middle of the day. It's also a little bit uh, intrusive on tourists. So one of the evolutions we've had is we've got much better beach cleaning equipment. It's not perfect, still have a ways to go. And a lot more ability now with some of the turtle watch people and some of the fish and wildlife and the other commissions helping out to get a lot more night operations. It allows us to pick up the tar balls when they're solid, more solid. It allows the beach workers to not work under very extreme conditions that uh, compromise their safety. And, you know, quite frankly, I think we're going to look at, again, some enhanced opportunities for that beach. The beach does have a replenishment program, a cycle that they go through anywhere, anyway here, and I don't know how that will feed into that, but they typically replenish the beaches to keep them white here uh, through a lot of dredging. Uh, and. There's people in the room that know a lot more about that program, but there may be a way to integrate those two together. And I, I was just going to say the, some of the same stuff. It's basically the bioremediation. And when we say bioremediation, that's going to happen on the beach regardless. There are natural bugs out in the environment, both in the water and in the soil, that will eat those hydrocarbons. Um, right now, what, what the plan is is get the, the gross stuff off the beach. When I say gross, I just don't mean like looking at it and going, ooh, gross, but the, the big stuff. The get that off so it's not getting buried, and then there is tar ball or our tar balls that are making it into the lower levels of the beach, but it's really not effective right now to try to go in, you know, a foot underneath the sand to try to get everything because you know the next tide that comes in is probably going to bring more tar balls. So what I expect to happen is once we quit getting the daily and and more frequent impacts and it gets back to our normal, every year Florida gets around five to six hundred dollar dollar money mine's on money uh, five to six hundred tar ball reports a year anyway just for the natural oil that's out that's getting into the gulf the other accidents and spills that occur in the gulf we're impacted by tar balls every year obviously not to the extent we are this year once we get back down to the level of where it's the kind of a, a, a normal situation then there'll be an assessment made as to how deep and how widespread the oil contamination is left on the beach and then there will be a decision made on, okay, how do we get rid of that? One of the demonstrations that we've been trying to set up for several weeks is a bioremediation demo where we bring in the different companies that have bioremediation technology, which basically, I say technology, it's fairly simple. It's bugs, it's nutrients, and it's the oil. And, and there's different combinations. There's different, you know, super bugs and different kinds of uh, super nutrients that they add to it. But that's really, it's, it's a... It's putting salt on your steak and eating it, and, and, and there's always a limiting factor. Um, so what we want to look at is, is there an effective way to add bioremediation to it? Um, I don't know if it'll work or not. That's one of the things we want to kind of set up and, and let the vendors demonstrate how effective their technology is, um, and that'll factor into the ultimate decision that gets made. Uh, and so my answer, my, question, my answer, my bottom line answer to your question is, yeah, I think the beaches will get back white again. I can't give you a time frame because the first factor in that is how long are we going to keep getting above normal impacts. So that's the first time frame. And then once that's ended, there'll be another time frame where we evaluate what's left. And, and hopefully by then we'll have done some other demonstrations so we'll know the best way to attack it. Okay, we're going to move on now. Uh, Dorothy, do you have any comments? I'll open the floor to you at right this time. Um, a lot of folks have asked about the wildlife sanctuary. Um, B 
BP and U.S. Fish and Wildlife <clears throat> Unified Command, they actually hired um, two groups that are your oil response network teams. They are the top in the U.S. One is out of California, one is out of Delaware. They are the first responders who have gone and set up in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and now Florida. The Wildlife Sanctuary, we've been here in Pensacola for 28 years. We do wildlife rehabilitation. It's a little different ball game. They are oil response. We do the rehabilitation. So we are assisting them in the fact that they are doing the oil spill, but they are also picking up injured wildlife. And anything from Panama City to Gulf Shores pretty much then gets transferred to our facility. So they concentrate on your oiled wildlife, and we concentrate on those that have been injured. We are with state and federal permits through U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So we can do all types of wildlife, but right now oil spill is really contained to tri-state that's in our area. And they are, they're doing an amazing job because they can just focus just on that. Um, they've got folks that bring them wildlife that are picked up and rescued. Once they're at their facility, then it's, it's a wonderful system of what they're doing, but they have a big challenge of how many days that's been out there. Um, the dolphin issue, we don't handle marine mammals. That was another area, but unfortunately the, the dolphin issue is hard because we don't know how long it was out there playing in the oil. You don't know how many days of exposure. And a lot of folks had questions over the response time. And that has improved. We're all thrilled about that. Instead of four hours to eight hours of response, we're now at about an hour response time for people who call in because they changed that call center to a more local area. So when people are trying to give a description of where the wildlife is, they actually know where that is and come quicker. But the dolphin is was so difficult for all of us and the folks who did respond only because it's difficult to backtrack what they've ingested while they're playing and out there being dolphin and that's what they do. So hopefully we won't see any more of that. As far as the wildlife goes, we'll continue our role to assist U.S. Fish and Wildlife and whatever needs to be done for the community. Um, we are a local agency as opposed to the state and federal agencies. Yeah, uh, th this was, uh, that was Dorothy Kaufman, the director of the Wildlife Sanctuary of Northwest Florida. And I want to personally thank you for your years of service to this community, um, um, taking care of uh, uh, handling wildlife, uh, the uh, troubled wildlife. Uh, um, and uh, I just want to thank you publicly. I think everybody in the room uh, should, should thank you. But uh, I just want to recognize you. And again, thank you very much for your service to this community and our wildlife. Thank you. Okay. Any questions for Dorothy from the audience? This time? Please, if you will, just come on up to the microphone. I'm going to take about two or three questions and we'll have to move on. Okay, my question is, um, when um, an employee of BP that's cleaning up the beaches, obviously they're, they're probably the most likely to come into contact with wildlife that has been um, impacted by the spill, um, and it's at night, what do they do? What, what do the BP employees do, the cleanup crews? Um, who, do they, who do they contact? I'm going to pass the torch because we are not the ones that they call. We don't do rescues. We run a hospital seven days a week. Okay. Um, so, so they bring them to that, you, the, the rescue people bring them to let's you? Let Lewis is going to answer that. Okay. He's going to go that way. Okay. Lewis? Um, first off, if they're out there at night, they're, they're first off, they they're, they're have to have wildlife monitors working with each crew that's out there. So if they were to come across it, they would call the toll-free number, just like the public calls. That then is dispatched to um, uh, trained, and, and, and mostly they're employees of either U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the National Park Service, our agency, or 
some of the wildlife rehabbers that have been hired to assist with that pickup. So they would be dispatched to go to and pick the bird up. They have protocols or bird or turtle or whatever it is. They have protocols of how to document that, GPS it, get you know where it was located, they have some paperwork to fill out, and then get it to Tri-State. And then at that point, Tri-State takes it and treats the bird or turtle or whatever. Okay, and that's 24 hours a day, that operation that's is? That's correct. Okay, good. Um, you don't know the time lapse between um, getting a call and it actually getting to the well, survival our, center? Our, we're getting close to an hour. We, we've had some horror stories of four to five hours. I'm not going to kid you. When it's starting up, we had some chinks in our armor. and But I think through time, we've been able to whittle that down. That's been one of our main goals is to get that response to time. We prefer less than an hour. And, and I think we've gotten fairly close to that recently in the, in the last several weeks. I think we've been meeting that, that goal and that challenge. Okay. Well, that's, I also wanted to add that the BP cleanup crews are not out on the beach without federal supervision. There, there's a federal presence there all the time. I went to observe that personally myself today because I know that that's yeah. part of our protocol and that there are um, people as a part of the response that are there with the crews um, whenever right, the Right, yes, I've out. witnessed that myself also. Yes, even at night, I have. Um, and, and one last um, piece, piece of information that maybe the uh, scientists could debunk for us also. Um, I have done some research on previous oil spills when it comes to the lost wildlife that we're never able to account for. And it's estimated that about 90% of the wildlife that is um, a victim of an oil spill never gets found. That it's only about 10% of that that's actually recovered, as in the Exxon Valdez and, and others that you might be um, knowledgeable of also. So I was wondering if you could debunk that, like the picture of the um, tire marks on the turtle that you said was also to be debunked. But anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Did that cover you all uh, the other questions? Ma'am, please. If there's any other questions for this subject? Okay, sir, come on up. Stand here at the behind My name's Lori McPhee, <laughs> and I was interested if you could address the issue of the food source that you're using to feed the birds. Um, what you past use, what you're currently use, and what you're expecting to use, like where are you going to be getting the fish from to feed the recovered birds? I don't know tri-states um, where they're getting their things, but ours is brought in by a lot of locals, and then where we purchase ours through um, Fort Walton Beach area, they're getting it in large volume for their facility um, and a lot of the stuff we use are freshwater fish we are really concerned about that um, because we're not sure how far into this it's going to be so it's a major concern and I wish I had all those answers but we just kind of for us we take it a day at a time but obviously that's a big concern for our seabirds it's more of a concern of the ospreys that are flying around and do they catch fish or do they starve? And if they catch fish, are they oiled? And it, it truly is an issue for the community. In connection with that, let's say um, fishermen that have been out fishing and they're not supposed to eat fish, uh, uh, is there any way that you have a way to accept fish? Would they be safe for the fish? And mentioning along that line too, I've had an opportunity to be around the um, Big Lagoon Sound in the last several weeks extensively, and I've noticed what bird life I do notice, the birds aren't fishing. The birds seem to be acting like, you know, gosh, I, I wish I knew where I could get a meal. They just seem to be bewildered and they're flying around and, and they're just not fishing. 
they're not diving for fish and they're some not of our eating fish that is a concern and, and I know they follow minnows and things like that there's a lot of freshwater areas that believe it or not our seabirds go to um, we're very lucky that the herons do the same thing and you'll see gulls and such a lot of places where they'll do um, a lot of your smaller lizards and things that are mm -hmm. in the grasses but they do a lot of the freshwater minnows and stuff as well and I think that's going to end up pulling us through but as far as the fish goes we are very uh, fortunate to have so many donations coming in but again most of them are um, we had a group bring in with tilapia ponds and things like that there's a lot of ponds in the north end of the county catfish ponds tilapia ponds koi ponds and again the community has really supported us on that and we so appreciate it because fish is a concern for all of us especially the wildlife thank you, thank you. sir Please state your name for us. My name is Carl Clark, and I'm from Bruno Park in North End County. Uh, the question I have is, uh, is there training available for responders? That's one part of the question. And because we know probably the effects of this thing is going to probably last a long time from just what we know about the Valdez spill and from what I remember about my time in the Coast Guard along the Texas coast in the 70s, there were tar balls there even then. So we know probably this stuff is going to be around here for a long time. What's going to be in place in the future uh, after the majority of these folks go home from cleaning uh, when something happens with an animal? Okay. I'll take the first part. And the first part is as far as we'll be around, and I don't know what the future holds for us. Um, we're going to keep doing what we do as far as for wildlife. We're there seven days a week from 8 to 5 for injured and orphaned wildlife. As far as response, training, and such, I'm going to pass the torch. I think one of the, uh, for some, let me talk about training for a minute. Then there was a, as you know, in this area that's prone to hurricanes, there's a lot of volunteer groups, and people are very good about coming together in natural disasters. And it's not to be unexpected that in this disaster, people wanted to come together too. And there was an enormous number of people who wanted to volunteer and do things and help out. And the, the real challenge for us as a company was we didn't want to put them in harm's way. Those people weren't necessarily trained for dealing with oiled materials and we didn't want to put them in that position. And yet we still wanted to get them trained and allow them to do things. So we found opportunities for volunteers um, to actually do beach cleanups that don't involve oiled materials allows them to get engaged with the process. We had people that have a medical background or a veterinarian background that actually took training so they could work with the oil uh, wildlife recovery team with tri-states, as was mentioned here. And then we had other people that went on and took actual HAZWOPER training and uh, from some of our contractors to actually work with the oil materials. So a lot of interest in the community about solving problems in their own backyard, and I think that, that is always key. Uh, we can never have enough resources when we're, when we're in a situation like this. I will tell you that in terms of duration, and we've said it before, BP will be here to make it right. We're gonna stay as long as we need to until the beaches are white again. Um, and that is part of social responsibility. And so I, I think in years to come, my hope, uh, as one of the people that raised their hand and said they wanted to help out within the company down here is that you look back and say, that company did everything it could to make this right. It's an unfortunate incident, but I think if you look around the table here, you will see all the different federal, state, and local agencies that we have expertise here from to work together to make this the best of the situation we can. So that's what I'd like to say. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, uh, Mr. Olson, I'm going to give you a moment if you'd like any just open floor comments. Yeah, I don't have any prepared speech. I'm happy to address any, any questions, but I do want to make mention of a couple things. You probably noticed a pretty significant shift in the way uh, your beaches have uh, uh, appeared lately and the fact we don't have much oil out on uh, the open water right now. And so always in the past we've attacked this much like you would with a, with a medical in, uh, injury. It's sort of a triage. You know, you have to go to the 
the highest risk area first, and that's always been the well. Until you, until you shut down the source of oil, you can never get your beaches fully white again. And so the effort has been mostly through the containment, the various capping mechanisms, all, all the people that had to come together to try to figure out what to do at 5,000 feet below the water surface. I think what you've seen over the last 12 days is that containment cap has held and it's kept the pressure up. And so for the last 12 days, what we've seen is an enormous amount of breakdown of the oil. We, we're lucky you were in the Gulf of Mexico and not up in Alaska. Things are warm here, the sun burns bright, and a lot of the volatiles do dissipate with that. And then a lot of the wave action and the, the dispersants that break up oil into those small droplets allow those bacteria to attack that oil. So that by the time it reaches this area, what you're really only left with is the heavy residual ends that are hard to break down, much like the asphalt in our roadways. Um, so I would say that, that what, you, what, what there's some confusion around is we, a lot of people saw some of the assets, you saw boom coming off the water, you saw vessels leaving the water, you saw a lot of trucks deploying equipment away. And that was done for a particular purpose. I mean, obviously we're in hurricane season right now. And one of the things that Hurricane Bonnie that never was gave us a chance to do is figure out how to save the assets that protect this area. And so there was a lot of work to get the assets and people under a stormwater contingency plan into what I'll call high ground. Now you're starting to see those, some of those assets deployed back. But I would say because of the change in the situation, we're also going to monitor that and put the appropriate resources back out on the beaches and on the water to maintain this. If we need more resources, we have them and we'll bring them out. But we're not going to overload the beaches with beach workers when we don't have that much to clean up. And we're not, we have, you know, we have about 619 skimmers that have gone, are uh, vessels of opportunity, which are private vessels, looking for oil out on the, on the seas. Do we need 1,000 or 2,000? At this point, we don't think so, but we'll gauge the resources in an appropriate manner. But I will say that we are here to stay until it's done. All right. And Aaron, I, we heard from you a little earlier on summer waste management. Did you have any closing comments? Uh, not too many closing comments. Uh, just wanted to reiterate exactly what waste management was doing. We are contracted by BP to provide drivers, trucks, um, related equipment, containers, um, transport, and if necessary, disposal of oil contaminated material. And uh, we think we're doing a good job at that and uh, we want to continue to help out in any way we can. Okay. In closing as chair, I'd like to thank Mary Terrace for all her work in West Florida Regional Planning Council for bringing this panel together. As a community, we've got a lot of anxi anxiety on this subject. Uh, it's, a, it's natural. It's a disaster that certainly none of us uh, would ever want to have to face again. Unlike the disasters we've been through before with, uh, you know, hurricanes, it's something we know is coming, we can prepare for, and as it leaves, we can start to get ready for preparations and make preparations to recover from that. Uh, finally, with the capping, I think we can maybe start eyeballing some preparation means. Uh, I'd like to thank each one of you for taking your time together uh, today to, for being out to this roundtable discussion. As chairman, I wanted to have this uh, Bay Area Resource Council meeting uh, to reiterate uh, to the public that the council is taking an active stance in this uh, through Mary through the council that, uh, of uh, both counties and, and the municipalities that are involved. Uh, thank each one of you for taking your time to come out. And hopefully, you know, as we go through this, help each other out because there's all different levels of stress in the community on this, how we can help people anticipating wanting to help and, and really don't know what to do because uh, uh, we just can't all run out there with a, with a spatula and start picking things up. or or drying things up or whatever we want to do. But everybody wants to go out and do something. So my advice is get involved with some of the volunteer groups, uh, with animal uh, rescue, different CERT and, and different organizations that have stood up. Uh, get involved with those. If you know somebody that's level of stress is getting to where you think they're about to pop a cork, help that person or get them that person to somebody because you know, we're all in this thing together. We've got to, you know, we've got to recover from it. Uh, we've been truly blessed in the fact that we've had, compared to some other uh, states, we've had a, a really 
uh, not as much, and we've certainly you know, had plenty, but not as certainly not as much as some other areas have had. Uh, that's certainly a blessing to us, but we've got to stay stay on this. We don't know what a storm might bring up. There's all kind of questions of the different levels of oil in different water columns, uh, oils that could be uh, down in the deep water trenches that could come up uh, during a storm or hurricane event. I think you've uh, the public seen now that there is due diligence being taken care of from BP, from DEP, EPA, everybody. There was certainly at some at one point in time a a high level of mistrust and 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 uh, basically no trust at some points. I think for what we were hearing, uh, hopefully that's all getting resolved. We're starting to see you know more you know more active involvement with the local communities, local government, getting reports, having local, uh, you know, local basis for reporting back rather than having to go the whole way to Mobile or all the way to Louisiana. We have local incident command areas stood up. And that certainly cuts down response time and helps everybody. And we have our local, you know, we have local folks out on the water. Uh, people that I know like Pasco Gibson and Pete Russell local folks from Santa Rosa County, local people like Robert Turpin from Escambia County, uh, just too many that I can't even begin to name them all, uh, to, to raise that level of confidence with the local citizens that, that we are being diligent in what we're doing and getting these reports back to these agencies so they can be taken care of as soon and as quickly as possible. So again, thank you all for coming out. I'm going to call for a, okay, we got one late, okay, I'm going to let Come on, let's. Um, I wanted to ask a question of the BP rep. Um, Margaret Hostetter, I live in East Hill. Um, I've, I understand that 30 to 40 percent of the oil evaporates rather quickly, and a lot of that that is evaporating is toxic materials like benzene and so forth. And so uh, the question is pertaining to the air. Um, and well, evaporation is one thing, but you know, I'm presuming it's going to go through a cycle. And uh, what kind of tests are done uh, today? And how are those air quality tests comparing? And what concerns might we have for the air? Thank you. I'm going to actually. <laughs> Carol's nodding her head. I'm going to flip it to somebody who really can answer this question. I think there has been some monitoring out at the well sites as well, but uh, Carol, if you can make any comments on that, it'd be great. Yes, there. Um, we have done some testing above where closer to where the spill is to look for those organics. One of the things that we have noted is the organic aerosols that have been forming up above the area of the spill. Um, we've tried to trace those. Right now, we are not able to trace those to near shore uh, levels. We're, um, we believe right now we're looking into a little bit further what is happening with those. We do know that they're still somewhat volatile and can break down. So we're running um, tests and modeling to see you know, what's the final disposition of those uh, fine aerosols. But we did detect some aerosols, organic aerosols, above this, um, the location of the spill itself. Um, we've done very careful air monitoring near shore and onshore and have not been able to trace those elevated levels um, in the populated areas. All right. Well, I'm going to, Carol, thank you very much for coming down today. Thank all our panelists for coming down today.